churches. Let's just avoid the things associated with idolatry, sexual morality, for the betterment and the cohesion of the church. So his letter is sent out really solidifying and protecting the unity of the church. And yet, in our passage today, we see even just two very important Christians in the church finding that they have to part ways, that a dispute, a division divides them. So let's see here in Acts 15, starting in verse 30, as this letter is sent off. Acts 30 begins to tell us, So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. There arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from one another. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed to Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. This is the word of the Lord. I don't know if you noticed last month um, in the hallways by our church, maybe, you know, walking by that door in that hallway and the hallway by the bathroom, there are these large metal ladders, this large metal, metal scaffolding that was a little bit in the way for you walking, right? Uh, it, our landlord had been installing um, kind of a roof access ladder in, our, ladder in our storage room, and it took a few weeks to put together. It wasn't too inconvenient, but maybe just a little annoying having to walk along things, especially any parents with strollers having to wheel that through. A little difficult to walk around, step around for three weeks, right? Imagine 300 years, a ladder being in the way at the church. How could, a, how could that scenario ever be the case? A ladder being in the way of the church for 300 years? Well, there is one such church where there is the case. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. This church is the, what many to believe, the site where Jesus rose from the dead, the site of his tomb. There is a ladder sitting outside a window that has not been able to be moved for such a long time. Now, it has to do with kind of who owns this church. You might think, what lucky like denomination gets to own the church above the ground where Jesus rose from the dead? We get to have our church above the ground from Fontana Sports. They get to be on top of the holy tomb of Jesus. Well, it's not one church who owns that church. It's actually shared by six, at least six different churches. And they're all like pre-Protestant churches even too. It's the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, some Cyprian uh, Christians as well. There's so many different people who own that church. How do six different churches own one space, you ask? How do they possibly get along? Well, it starts to relate to this latter a little bit. You see, for them to get along, they have to agree to a certain status quo. That for anything to, to be moved, you know, you imagine you come here and rent, you know, use the space here. We ask that you return everything back to where, the way it was. But how anything gets moved in that church down to a candle, down to the cloth on the altar. Every little thing has to be discussed and agreed upon by the six different clerics there. So it's really hard to change anything. So we have no idea how that ladder got there, but no one can agree whose job it is to move it. Because no one really knows whose fault it is that the ladder ended up there. It's quite possible the ladder ended up at this church illegally, not by agreement of the six churches. So the six churches don't really know how to get the ladder out of there. So it's been there. We have a a photograph taken of it that's, uh, I think, over 100 years old. There is an engraving an art piece of this church from 1728. Yes, like 295 years ago, that still has that ladder in there. No idea how old this ladder is, but we just know it's not moving anytime soon. I think it's a striking picture of what division does to the church. 
when we all have parted ways, we leave a lot of, well, relational clutter in the church. Ladders all over the place that we can't agree how to deal with when we've separated, when we've parted ways, when we've divided. It truly is sad, and it should sadden us, how our divisions affect the church itself. When Christians, as we saw in our um, call to worship, how good it is when brothers dwell in unity, what happens when brothers and sisters can't dwell in unity? Ladders. Ladders everywhere. It's a good reminder for us of how important unity is, and it should make us all the more sad when we see that disunity, when we see those disputes happen, the the parting of ways, even that we see with Paul and Barnabas this morning, who cannot, cannot find a way to agree, cannot find a way forward, so they, their missions divide. We end up with two separate missions here. Let's understand here the nature of their dispute, why they part ways. What about when we part ways? What are the situations, the circumstances where we, with, within other denominations, denominations as well as other believers, what happens when we part ways? But what is not so much in view, but has just kind of left us at a, a, a small glimmer of hope at the end of our passage, is that God still strengthens his church. And he strengthens us in our journey towards reconciliation. So, knowing that we're at, that's where we're going, we're going to talk about reconciliation. First, we have to understand these partings of ways, these disputes, these arguments, these disagreements. What makes, I think, the dispute between Paul and Barnabas all the more tragic is how this this little pericope begins. We begin with the rejoicing of the church together, of the Gentiles hearing, no, we're still going to have unity with with our Jewish brethren. When they heard it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged, and what did they do? They strengthened the brothers with many words. You know, I think it's interesting, the names, Judas and Silas. One's a very Jewish name, Silas or Silvanus, as it is in the Greek. It's not a Jewish name. Bringing this good news to the Gentiles is a a Jew and a Greek working together for the glory of the kingdom. Beauty of, of unity, of strength happening there. The burden of having to follow the law has been lifted as Silas preaches to them and encourages them. There's so much joy and we should feel that energy and that energy of the joy in the church carries over and washes over Paul and Barnabas seeing, wow, what what great unity and joy there is in the church. Let's see where that joy is throughout the church. Yes, let's return to the churches we planted on our first journey. Let's, let's do a tour and continue to find our hearts lifted up and encourage one another. And Barnabas says, yes, let's take John Mark. And Paul goes, that's where you lost me. What happens here is they talk about what it means to return on this tour, and they cannot agree of their travel companion, John Mark. Because it says in verse 38 there, after Barnabas wants to take with them John called Mark, Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them for the work. It's because of this sharp disagreement in themselves, this sharp disagreement. They separated from another. Paul, Barnabas goes with Mark to Cyprus and Paul takes Silas elsewhere. Paul and Barnabas want to run it back, but they can't do it because they cannot agree on taking John Mark with them. It says, literally, this sharp disagreement is like, it's like a stirring up of emotion. Have you ever felt your emotions like stirred up as if they're starting to boil up and, and you're just agitated? I think it's right to assume this is actually a pretty agitated, pretty tense disagreement. So what problem does Paul have with John Mark? What did John Mark do? We don't actually get that much detail. I think Luke is doing a good job of being objective and also, I think, protecting the reputation of John Mark. We just know that in Acts 13, 13, that when Paul and Barnabas set sail, um, that John Mark drew back. They set sail to Paphos and came from Perga to Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. John Mark says, I got to go home. We don't know why. But we just simply know maybe it's possible that missionary work was just a little bit too taxing. It was more than he bargained for, more than he expected. It was difficult. 
And so it was not part of the plan for, them, for him to go back home. He goes back earlier than expected. And we see kind of two positions, two approaches to this. Barnabas wants to show grace. Barnabas wants to give him another chance. And it's not surprising. Barnabas is, after all, that son of encouragement, that positive guy, that one kind of person who is always on your side. John Mark, as it happens to be, is also Barnabas's cousin. So I think even more this kind of familial relation kind of helps him bring along. Keep in mind, this is not the mark of the gospel of Mark. This is a separate mark. That's why we know him as John Mark here. But we just know that even though he withdrew when things get, got rough, Barnabas thinks, no, I want to give him another chance. He's my cousin. I know him. But Paul, I think also rightly so, wants to set a standard of commitment. He wants to know you're locked in for this journey. That's not a wrong thing to desire, not a one wrong thing to set forward. Because Paul knows it's hard work. Look, Paul's almost died several times. He was nearly murdered and came up alive when he wasn't expected to after he was stoned. Paul doesn't want people who are just very in it for a short time. Who, when things get hard, hard will fall away. You can understand how scarred and wounded Paul is that he has no patience for people who are fair-weather missionaries, right? So he says, no, I'm not taking with someone who's not fully committed. And it's interesting, Luke doesn't tell us which person is right or wrong. Again, Luke is a good objective observer. And I think it's good for us to remember, too, that both of these responses, wanting to show grace and give it a second chance, and also holding up a high standard of commitment, are both right things for us to do, especially in the service of the church. That, yes, there is grace when we sin. There is grace when we fail. There is a path of forgiveness but there are also standards of living. There are standards of leadership, standards of serving in the church. And it's good to emphasize both. Does grace mean that when someone sins, especially like a pastor, someone in high standing, that immediately when they confess their sin and repent, that they should be just be restored to the same position they were at? No, not automatically, no, not always. It takes judgment and wisdom about how to respond when setting a standard of living, of walking, as well as showing grace. I think the important thing above, that all, above it all for us to remember is that all our sin does have a consequence. And sometimes we do have to deal with the consequences of our falling away, of our falling back. After all, yes, we talk about our grace in Jesus Christ, that God forgave our sins. And in the sense that our record, our sins were wiped away. It doesn't mean that our sins just had no consequence. It doesn't mean that our sin is inconsequential. Because when we look at our Savior, our resurrected Savior, do you know who we see? Someone who bears in his hands and his feet and his side the wounds of the crucifixion. Those wounds that he bore because of my sin. My sin has grave consequences. But Jesus took the consequences on himself rather than me bear them myself. So we cannot just simply say that because of Jesus, our sin has no consequence. It does. He bore the consequence on, on the cross. And there may still yet be earthly consequences for some of our falling away. Yet there is still grace that we are still found acceptable to God because of what Jesus has done. As I said, how we walk this line is difficult kind of feels like I'm saying both things, grace and consequence. How do we know how to communicate both? It's difficult. It's so difficult that a great theological and biblical mind like Paul doesn't know how to bring it to resolution with Barnabas. They still disagree and they part ways. So how does this guide for us when we part ways? You see, in all of our disputes... This is just a picture of just two Christians. We'll get to what we do when we have just another Christian who disputes with us. But we see this happens in the church all the time, between even denominations itself. Just look at the state of the church now. Does it feel like the church is united? That the church is one church? I have a, a picture here of American Presbyterian Reformed churches. That sounds pretty niche, right? 
like just American and Presbyterian Reformed churches, that's got to be like two or three, right? Um, this is going back like 300 years. This messed up map. Um, we are here uh, where it says 1973. That's the, the PCA. That's where we are. Somewhere in there you can trace back to the beginning. Everywhere you see a circle, that's the good news. Circle is a union. Church is coming together. Yay. Every square is division. But of course, for every circle, it usually came after a division of some kind. Yeah. The church is a messy, messy thing. And that's as like organized as it possibly can be. <laughs> the church is a mess. The church is a mess. And it... It is just, that, like I said, is a very niche thing, Presbyterian Family Connections of America. So this is just 300 years. You know, even kind of putting it another way, too, I was in a, a coffee shop uh, this past Monday beginning to work on this sermon, and I began to strike up a conversation in the coffee shop with a local Baptist pastor and a Roman Catholic studying his master's in theology. And it sounds like the beginning of a bad joke. Uh, it's not. It really happened. Uh, and... Especially, I, I kind of eavesdropped in their conversation. They're talking about Greek, and that's, I think I just hang out in coffee shops waiting for people to talk about New Testament Greek and being, hello. Um, and, but what we started talking about is, like, how do we find unity in the church? Especially talking with the, the local Baptist pastor. Of like, you know, how do we work together with other churches? What is unity for the kingdom? What is, you know, ecumenism look like in our day and age. And he, we're talking like, it's, it's really difficult too. And we're talking late of this passage and saying, you know, we can really kind of focus on churches we just agree with. I've been with a pastor's prayer group in the Madison area of other similar reformed churches, similar to the, that messed up uh, outline we saw. But there are other churches, you know, that I can be connected to of just broader, very broad connections of just you know, from all over the map that we can kind of work together. But how? How do you work together when you start working with other churches who have completely different views on sin and Christian living? Different views on how we're supposed to read the Bible, how the Bible should be uh, preached, how we are supposed to worship. It starts to get hard to welcome each other, even to each other's churches. we got completely different views of even what the worship of the church should be, of what we should, of what we should be teaching, of what we should be saying. It starts to get hard. Uh, some of the differences can be a little bit more negligible. I call them just kind of uh, different paths, different journeys that we find ourselves on. One of the uh, churches on the prior slide was the OPC, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, or as they call themselves, the only perfect church. Um, it's always funny when they say that to me. Uh, the, the difference between PC and OPC is like just timing. Really. <laughs> they formed in 1936, we in 73, and because of what has happened the last 40, the 40 years between those formations, we probably won't join back together, but like, we really could, we agree on so much. But we've just gone on parallel journeys, and that's absolutely fine. Other differences start to become a little greater than something like that. You know, I was talking with, you know, the, the local Baptist minister who's very reformed in his view on salvation and on worship. But, you know, the differences we have is how the church should be governed. Uh, are, are there more connections between churches or fewer, looser connections? What do we view on baptism and the Lord's Supper? Differences start to come out a little bit there. But enough so that we could simply worship in each other's churches and not really bump on those differences a whole lot. A lot of work could be done together there. Those are just a few examples. And so you can start to preserve our parallel journeys in a lot of ways as we work through these things, working, building for the kingdom. Then things get a little bit different when we have some, we keep some kind of greater differences where it would be start to get harder to work together. Sometimes it's like how the church is structured, how the church is to worship. Start to become differences where it's like, well, you know, maybe the way you would do things here I would have a problem with, and the way I would choose to do things you would have a problem with, or what I would teach on on this passage you would strongly disagree with. So we can still work with the kingdom together, but when we start doing essential things like worship, it starts to get a little, we kind of have to be a little flexible at times. It starts to get a little difficult. And then there are really, really big differences where fellowship really can't even be had. Churches where, for, for example, a completely different view of Scripture. If it's, is it the inerrant, inspired Word of God? Does church tradition kind of read over it? 
example, in the Roman Catholic Church, it's Scripture as read and handed to us by the church as it's interpreted there. So it's really hard to find agreement on how we interpret Scripture. Other churches might get really fuzzy on the miraculous parts of Scripture. Did Jesus really rise from the dead, or did he rise more in a metaphorical way, in a way that helps us to overcome challenges? That would make it really hard to celebrate Easter together, I'd imagine. These bigger differences, differences of how we understand the creeds, how we understand Scripture, makes it really hard to continue to have fellowship together. Churches that would say, unless you're part of our church, you can't have communion with us, makes it hard to truly have fellowship. So we understand that there are different denominations, we can work together, we can serve the kingdom together, but there gets to be certain points where our journeys really do diverge. What I think is important for us to keep in perspective is of kingdom work. Are we doing work for our church in our ministry, or are we seeing how other churches who may have slightly different beliefs, slightly different practices, are they still working for the kingdom, bringing souls into repentance and following Jesus Christ? Are they pointing others to Jesus Christ and the cross? We can be grateful for that kingdom work, just as Paul and Barnabas have to part ways and go in different directions. In some ways, it's good because... One ministry now is going to Cyprus. Another ministry is going northward, over land, one by land, one by sea. There is great work for the kingdom being done. So when we see different denominations, we can also be grateful for the spreading of God's kingdom. We should pray to that end. So, so often, let us also think about the disputes we might have between believers what disputes we might have between believers. These can be often problems when we... Um, oh, one, one thing, just kind of briefly saying again, too, about different denominations is focusing on what does unite us, what do we agree on, rather than just focusing simply on what divides us, what we disagree on. And that can be a helpful guide for us, too, when we're talking with the differences we have with believers. Problems where it's not just simply church beliefs, but problems in... Has someone sinned against you, wronged you? Have you wronged the person? It can be difficult because sometimes we might look at a situation and not agree on a problem. One of you might think, well, it's not really a problem, this situation. The other person say, yes, this is a problem. That can create a bit of a disagreement where it's hard to work together. Other problems can be, you both agree there's a problem, but you cannot agree on the solution, what the right course of action is. Both these things can start to get things to be emotionally charged, just like Paul and Barnabas stirring up the emotions, stirring up differences, stirring up your, your inability to compromise. We can compromise so much, and it's important for us to seek compromise, but we shouldn't compromise our convictions. And when we start pushing on the convictions, the things that we are deeply, deeply convinced about, it's hard to find a way forward. It's hard to continue to stay together. But what about when someone has sinned against you? If you've hurt someone, or, you, or they've hurt you, it can be hard if neither side is willing to repent, neither side willing to acknowledge where they have been wrong, where they have sinned. That makes it hard to step forward, and especially if someone has sinned against you and they refuse to see the sin, it starts to feel like you're working with a different set of beliefs, a different code of Christian living. It's so much harder to find reconciliation in that situation because you just cannot agree on, even if you are confessing and believing the same thing. It starts to get scary there. Your fellowship may feel broken. And it's in those situations where it's helpful when you're both entrenched in how you see it to follow Jesus' path of Escalation to reconciliation, which is bringing a fellow brother or sister, a witness to it, to help mediate this. And even if that doesn't work, taking it to the church, there are paths for us to find reconciliation so we don't end up just dividing with everyone who's ever had a problem with us. Again, we're going to look at reconciliation, how kind of difficult this can be. But before we talk about that, I want to talk about how important this first step is, and that is prayer. To pray... Pray for them. Your prayer must continue regardless. For P, for 2 Peter 3.9 tells us that God desires no one to perish but all to come to repentance. When we're really at odds with someone else, can't it feel just so easy to feel like, man, I want them to perish. I, I want them to just 
wrought with all that they've done. That's not what we're called to do. We're called to pray for their repentance. Pray for your own repentance. Pray for your heart. Because if we pray that the Lord will strengthen them, he will. But if we live okay with condemning one another, we're not strengthening the church. We are leaving ladders everywhere, tripping over one another, cluttering the church with division and anger and resentment. And that is not the way the church will be strengthened. Rather, the church is strengthened by God's work, by God sending the mission through, by God establishing his kingdom, and by God strengthening us to reconcile with one another too. We're going to see in this situation how later there is re- reconciliation. We hear it later, um, we hear later throughout Scripture how Paul does commend other churches that John Mark will be very, send John Mark with me. He's very useful to me. And trust John Mark is with you. Other parts of Scripture. Later, Paul is writing in letters how much he appreciates John Mark. That relationship does get restored eventually. Although we don't see it right here in this passage. But in the meantime, until that happens, does just Paul out of nowhere just forgive his brother? No. It says all, all the way beginning, as soon as they part ways, that God is strengthening the church. God is already at work strengthening the church. Now, you could look at this situation, right, and see, well, there's now two, where there was going to be one missionary journey, now there's two missionary journeys, one by sea to Cyprus, another by land. Well, we are just like multiplying missionary journeys. Isn't this good? Can we call the division a good thing then? I don't think so. As our call to worship says, how good it is when brothers dwell in unity. And are they in unity right now? No, they're Feelings are probably still hurt. We're going to have to wait till later in the books of Timothy where Paul really admires John Mark, and we hear that again. In the same way, I myself am really grateful for, immensely grateful for the Protestant Reformation and what was protected and distilled and that, but I also mourn the division that's caused there, the separation, how it caused other people to be more entrenched, I think, in wrong views as well, and the proliferation of different Protestant churches. I don't see how that itself is always a good thing. It only sometimes feeds into the consumerist model of Christianity where we all just kind of pick and choose the church that is right for me rather than how we are called to seek God's truth. So I don't know if we can call all of our division a good thing. It pains the church. It wounds the church. Yet God can still work good even our inability to reconcile, even out of our sinful passions, our sinful motives, our inability to find agreement. You see, disputes are a problem. Division is a problem. And yet God still strengthens the church in spite of it, finds a way for it to be stronger. Let that be an encouragement to you then. If you're in the middle of a dispute with someone, if you're in the middle of division with someone and you're not yet reconciled, God's already finding a way to strengthen you. He's already working towards that. What will that reconciliation look like? It's it's hard to say. But for right now, the story is not over. And I want to encourage you in that. Just as the story is not over for Paul and Barnabas in this part, they will return. They will find reconciliation in small ways. And we can do it because God himself is the reconciler. He is the one who reconciles us. And we saw that in our assurance of pardon today, that you who are once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in the body of flesh by his death. It is in the death of Christ that we all find reconciliation, not just with God, who we are alienated and hostile to, but we are also alienated and hostile to one another, each on their own, each divided into their own single-person church. But God has reconciled us by the body of Jesus Christ, by his death, so that we might be preserved and presented holy and blameless. That's the promise we have in the reconciliation of Jesus Christ, in the work of Christ on the cross. As the resurrection from the dead means that all division, all disputes we have will find their end, will find their reconciliation in Christ. Because we meet at the same cross. We're forgiven the same cross, in the blood of the same Savior, in the faith of the same Savior, we find 
reconciliation. And Jesus himself also tells us in Matthew 5 how serious the command do not murder is, that it's not just simply striking someone down physically, but hating someone with a hateful, scornful heart, that itself is just as bad as murder. So he goes on to say in 5.23, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift and there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms with your accuser while you're going with him to court. Lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. Quite serious words from Christ. You know, we think of Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount being all, you know, freedom and forgiveness, but he also intensifies the law for us to see how desperate our sin is and what our divisions do. What does our division do? It affects our worship. If we stay disputing with one another, unreconciled with one another, it affects our ability to worship because it affects the church. Think about this. How can we be worshiping God and saying, Lord, I give you everything, but I'm going to withhold your love to this person because what they've done really just gets under my skin. We've not really been able to give the Lord everything if we're withholding his ability, if we're refusing him to strengthen us to reconcile. Let us take these words of Christ strongly that as we come to worship each Sunday to consider where are we unreconciled, And where is God working in spite of that? Because our division does damage, even though, even then, God can still work despite it. We must seek reconciliation. We must seek the strengthening of God in his church. Now, I can't say exactly what form that always takes, though. It might take time. It might just simply be, I'm praying for you, as we said before. But the reminder is that we always want to stick to our story and they have their story. What's the truth then? What is the truth of what happened? It should not drive us to really try to uh, solidify our story, but instead be driven to the truth, who is Christ. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And let our life and all truth be found in him. Because he is the one who has established the church himself as the cornerstone. He is the one who who cleanses the church and presents her as a pure bride. He will restore. He will mend. He will be our strength. And so if you have areas of division and disputes now, pray to Christ for those ends. It might take time. It might not be done yet. Pray that he would work in your heart and restore where there is division and bring motivation to truly worship the Lord as he has called us to do in his high priestly prayer that we would be one as he and the Father are one. That's a strong statement of unity, isn't it? To be one just as he and the Father are one. We may not see that fully until glory, until all is restored, but in the meantime, let us seek the strength of the Lord to reconcile. You know, when I was in college, I had a very good friend of mine who did something that deeply hurt me, wounded me. Felt like uh, my trust in them were, were broken. And he really put me in a pretty good deal of, of sharp pain. I was really in a dark place in the middle of the week. And coming into Sunday worship, really feeling like, yeah, I really need worship today because I am very unwell. And as I'm walking in, I see this friend pretty much walking in the same door at the same time as I. And it's hard enough, you know, when you're feeling really mad at someone to feel vindictive, even self-righteous, be like, well, I'm not going to be anywhere they are. I can't even bear the sight of this person. I'm going to turn around and walk away. That's really hard to do when you're walking into church to worship and I'm hearing the words of Christ in my my mind to reconcile before to go into worship. So I walk up to to him. I gave him a really tight hug and I took, and we took our seats together for worship, which was awkward uncomfortable as you can imagine. And then I remember we sang the hymn, Jesus, what a friend for sinners. And the Lord knew exactly that's what I needed that Sunday morning as I cry sang the whole hymn. As soon as the opening lyrics hit of friends may fail me, foes assail me, he my savior makes me whole. This call for us, if we have problems among one another, what's the status of that? 
And what I mean by that is, where's our prayer in that? Where's our journey in that? Is our, are our journeys just driving us further and further away and further and further away from Christ? Or are we praying for one another? Are we praying for God to strengthen us? Are you praying for them? That is how God can still be glorified, even as you're parting ways from someone. In the case of my friend from college, we never became real good friends again after that. It really did end the friendship. We drifted apart, graduated, went our separate ways, but I still prayed for him daily for the next like, two years after that. Anytime I thought of him, I prayed for him. I prayed for him. Because that's as I understood our calling in Scripture is, even if we cannot get along, can we still be driven to the same cross, the same Savior, who is our strength, who is the one who does make us whole. Let us pray to him today for that.